from Psalm 8 to the chief musician upon Gittith, a psalm of David. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passes through the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Well, welcome back to Truths from the Text. My name is Aaron Ventura. I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, Ryan Hurd, and this is episode five. And today, we are going to talk about God's body parts. So, um, in the last episode, we said that the first uh, negative name that we uh, say about God is that he is incorporeal, or that he does not have a body, or as Jesus says, uh, God is a spirit. So, I thought uh, today we could work on, uh, if God is not a body, what do we do with all those uh, passages where God is said to have body parts. So uh, before we dive into this, Ryan, could you say um, a word about this process of becoming just uh, more conscious of making something metaphorical? And then, um, you know, I think a lot of people just uh, automatically, instinctually would read a Psalm 8, and they don't think that God actually has fingers. Um, but we're now trying to become a little more awake to that. Can you just tell us a little bit more about that process? Yeah, so one of the primary uses and purposes of negative names, like God is not a body, is to keep us from error and also be used as principles of knowing something, not as positive principles, but as negative ones. In the sense that we are able to know because God is not a body, therefore, when he is said to have body parts or various properties that pertain to bodies, we can know from the negation what is not the case, what is not being said, especially in Holy Scripture, where we always know whatever is being said is true. And because we know God is not a body is true, and therefore God is a body is false, no matter what we find on the page of Holy Scripture, uh, it's never going to be the judgment, God is a body, or something of that sort, because we know that to be false. So negative names or negative judgments, especially these foundational ones, like God is not a body, are principles for knowing what is not the case particularly when we face other positive or affirmed names of God in Holy Scripture, like God has fingers, which we read in Psalm 8. So we read Psalm 8, we bring to mind the fact that God does not have a body, which we know is true. It's a first principle. Um, we know it's true from Holy Scripture. We can talk about proving it intellectually, and therefore we're enabled to uh, avoid thinking along false lines and therefore open up to consider uh, what is actually intended by God having fingers and, of course, many other body parts that are ascribed to God, uh, in addition to many other properties of bodies that are ascribed to God in Holy Scripture. Hmm. So I'm looking at uh, St. Thomas's Summa, and this is very early on, the first article under uh, question three, which is the article or the, the question of divine simplicity. And uh, if you've never read the Summa before and you try to read it, you're going to be very confused, perhaps, because it's going to start with all of these objections. Mm -hmm. So uh, you'll, you'll look at it. There will be a question, and it's, it's some kind of weather question, whether this is true. And so the whether God is a body is the, is, uh, the question here. And then he gives a bunch of objections that would seem to say that God does have a body with Bible verses. And, and then he's going to um, 
Actually, I shouldn't try to explain the whole format of the Summa. You're much better. You're much better at this. But I'm going to just read uh, one of the opening objections uh, on whether God has a body, and then we'll see um, how uh, Aquinas answers this. Uh, so, is it objection? Let's see. Um, Ryan, should I start with objection one or should I start with objection three? What would you suggest? Let's just go with objection three. Okay, uh, I think that's the clearest. All right, so I'll read this. Further, whatever has corporeal parts is a body. Now, Scripture attributes corporeal parts to God. And then he's going to give a Bible verse here. Job 40, verse 4 says, Hast thou an arm like God? And Psalm 33, verse 16 says, The eyes of the Lord are upon the just. And Psalm 117, verse 16 says, The right hand of the Lord hath wrought strength. Therefore, God is a body. Mic drop. Mm -hmm. All right. So, Ryan, there's my Bible verses. What do I do with those? Yeah, so this is a prime example of where what we know to be true, namely the negation, God is not a body, helps us in a negative fashion to know what is not the case and therefore avoid drawing wrong conclusions from the text of Holy Scripture. So objections like this in the Summa are used to um, argue in various ways here using Holy Scripture uh, for what's false. And most people, particularly operating at this initial baby step, number one, so to speak, God is not a body, um, are just not going to be persuaded, uh, no matter how many Bible verses you suggest to them. Uh, ascribing body parts to God, they're just not going to uh, think, at least in any clear way, that God actually has a body. Nonetheless, we we practice these kinds of steps uh, on the bunny slopes really, really clearly, so that when we get to more difficult situations, and trust me, they're out there, we know what to do. We use our true negations as negative principles of interpreting Holy Scripture and showing what's not the case. In the current situation, Thomas is given an objection, which is actually designed to show us, one, how the negation God is not a body helps us to interpret Holy Scripture negatively, but also, two, Thomas uses this objection to teach us the way in which we are to handle body parts ascribed to God in Holy Scripture. And so as he resolves this objection below in Resolution 3, he talks about what it means when we affirm God has an arm, God has eyes, God has a hand, and things like this. We know it doesn't mean he has a body, or he has a hand, or he has an eye, or he has uh, an arm, but rather these are all metaphors for something else that's true of God. And so they were put for something else. If you recall, I think we talked about last time, the definition of a metaphor is where something is put for another. Something is put for another. Metaphor in the philosophical or logical or theological sense, not in the literary sense. So arm, for example, in Holy Scripture is often put for strength. Uh, hand is often put for skill or power or something like that. Eyes, of course, are often put for knowing or seeing or perceiving because um, <coughs> eyes with us are for that purpose and similarly with an arm and a hand. So some of this is fairly straightforward logic, um, even so much that when you really drill down into it and focus your mind, you can kind of feel like it's a little dumb, uh, stating the obvious over and over. Okay, yes, it can be the case. But when we apprehend these kinds of principles very clearly and particularly get comfortable with things that we're certain are not true of God, like God is not body, and how those can advert us to the fact of metaphors in Holy Scripture. As we get comfortable with that kind of process, 
we're able to encounter the wild and raging text of Holy Scripture, which is far more difficult and also more exciting than simply these uh, practice texts, so to speak. So as we become comfortable with this process, it enables us to go further and deeper, which is why we focus on it so early on. Yeah, it's it's one of those um, instincts that once becomes once you become more explicit, especially when you're reading the Old Testament or something like the Psalms. So if you if you're reading the Psalms every day, or um, you know you're singing the Psalms in in worship, uh, you um, yeah you usually automatically um, put the thing for the other thing. So you think hand strength. We often automatically do that. However, I can think of like my little three-year-old where I actually have to help him through this process for the very first time when he thinks Mm -hmm. he's still thinking God has a sky hand. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to probably just let him think God has a sky hand for quite a while um, until eventually he can even grasp what um, that that doesn't mean and what that does mean. Right. Uh, Mm -hmm. You could. uh read through the Psalms. And if you just read through the Psalms with God is not a body, that negation in your head, and just see if you can notice all the times that it's using a metaphor, a bodily Mm -hmm. metaphor for something else, and then say, okay, what is the something else? And uh, as you said, it it can vary text to text. So you Mm -hmm. got to look around, you got to look at the context, you got to do your Bible study to see, in this case, you know, why is it Mm -hmm the right hand and not the left hand. Like what does God mm. have against left-handed people? Or, uh, you know, the famous passage in judges is uh, who, who is it who uh, has the left-handed sword and Egg, Eglid, Eglid, you know. yeah, Eglon kill, you know, the sword goes into the big fat belly. Yes. Great text. Every, for everyone boys. loves the story. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the Bible gives us, and also we just know from reality that the right hand is the hand that is more powerful. Um, mm. And there's something, you know, a lot of people, however, do have a powerful left hand. And so you're learning from your own creaturely reality. Um, you know, what does it mean when God uh, is said to have nostrils? What do I use my nose for? What happens in my body when I smell something bad versus smell something really good? When I smell something delicious, I come in the house and I just know my wife has made dinner or she's baked cookies. And in my body now, I just automatically, my appetite is aroused. And mm-hmm. so uh, this, is a, this is an experience everyone has, you know, who, who hasn't had COVID and uh, still has their sense of smell, of uh, the nostrils are a doorway to desire. Same thing, mm-hmm. the eyes are a kind of doorway to a different kind of desire. The ears are a kind of doorway to another kind of desire. And because we're creatures and we have bodies, well, this is probably mm. the easiest way for God to communicate to yeah. us what he is like. And and then you just run that negation and say, okay, yeah, what is a right hand for? What are my eyes yeah. for? What are my, my nostrils for? Um, other, other thoughts on this? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that last point is really particular uh, to laser in on. Thomas says uh, right here in this context of ST1Q3, um, Quote, Holy Scripture gives to us spiritual and divine truths under comparisons to our bodies. Um, Another famous saying, which uh, Maimonides and other Jewish theologians often like to quote is, um, Torah speaks in the language of men. And we know this, right? We know this under uh, names in our circles like divine accommodation, where God graciously condescends to speak to us. Thomas likes to um, use the use the uh, language of metaphor and things like this. But it's a, a way of accommodating to our reality that enables us to better and more easily perceive those spiritual and divine truths by starting from things that are close to home. So God is said to have a body and various other bodily properties or material properties to start us close to home, to latch us on, so to speak, to the train and therefore drive us more closely into God and get us 
deeper into these spiritual or divine truths, which could otherwise be really, really hard to know. In fact, this is an act, as Thomas says in ST1Q1, right in the opening of the Summa. This is an act of God's love and his kindness to us. Because we know things from the material surroundings with which we find ourselves, therefore God has taken up these material surroundings and used them as vehicles to teach us these deeper truths. With that said, it's really important here to remember that even though these things are said metaphorically, it doesn't mean that somehow their truthfulness is undercut or their reality and solidity is undercut. That's really, really important. And sometimes when people first get familiar with like a scholastic theology and particularly negative theology, as it negatively informs us as to what's not the case in Holy Scripture, they'll have people will have the feeling that we're pulling the rug out from under them. We're saying God has a body or God has an arm or something like that is only metaphorical. Maybe maybe we're even making a big deal about this. And people will suspect that this is undercutting the truth or derealizing or making less solid or something like that, uh, the things of God. This is not the case. When we say God has a hand, that is a metaphor for the true and very real uh, thing in God, namely his strength, his power. And that power, that strength is just as true and just as real as you could ever hope it to be. It just so happens that we used God has a hand as a means to get us to cognize or to apprehend that true and real thing about God. So the starting, the starting, uh, you know, the place where we start on this material plane is true insofar as it gets us to conclude what the metaphor was put for, right? So it's not true if we were to take this properly, that would be false. But of course, that's not the intention of Holy Scripture. But in that move, God has an arm, is put forth, God is strong. We eventually get to the true and real thing about God. And that's always really, really important. Um to recognize there's a lot of feeling that people are going to have as they get deeper into negative theology that eh, it just feels less less real um so keep this in mind and also recognize that the reason why it feels less real is because you and I are bodily creatures whose entire experience through and through is bodily and therefore when we use bodily states of affairs to get us into divine states of affairs, divine truths. And along the way, we strip out the body parts and body aspects and all of that. It's natural to feel a little crunch, uh, to feel a little uneasy. That's actually why God gave us the body metaphors in the first place was because it's hard to apprehend these other uh, immaterial realities above us. So just be familiar when you have that experience. This is the explanation. Don't lose your head. Um, and it will help you hopefully as we go along. One of the things that has helped me understand the kind of this accommodation or like why God speaks to us in the baby talk that he does, I find it always helpful to go down a step on the kind of ontological plane of being and just think, if I had to explain myself to a drawing on a on a page that exists in two dimensions or mm -hmm. yeah whatever you know it's just a a little color coloring and I had to explain my love my love for this little coloring in terms that it could understand mm -hmm. uh how would I do that well I'd probably have to you know I don't know draw a little heart or something on the on the page I would have to speak in the language of the little two-dimensional lifeless creature on the page mm -hmm. and that's um uh, god is far greater than i am compared to that little drawing and uh this is also part of what makes you know the incarnation such a ridiculous mind-blowing reality is that um god is now 
uh, giving us in Christ and in the Gospels uh, pictures of what, you know, if God had a body, here's what he would do with it. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. He would love people. He would touch them. He would heal them. Um, he, he would do all of these things that Jesus Jesus does. Uh, going, going back to Psalm 8 now, so we could kind of do some um, real working examples of this. So we've already done hand is power or strength. Uh, mm -hmm. In Psalm 8, it speaks of the work of thy fingers. So mm -hmm. how should we think of the fingers, at least just here in, in Psalm 8? What are God's fingers put for? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I always like to work from very clear principles and then get down into particulars. So the particular question is, we have fingers that are being said of God in the text of Psalm 8. Thomas really helpfully, I don't mean to jump us back to the Summa immediately, but back in the Summa ST1, Q3, A1, add 3, gives us a fundamental theological principle for how to interpret body parts when they're said of God in Holy Scripture. Here's the general principle that we almost always follow. It's your rule of thumb. And then under that general principle, we can look at the particulars relevant, for example, to uh, specifically fingers. So the general principle he gives is that when body parts are affirmed of God in Holy Scripture, there, uh, we, we see those affirmations because of divine activities, things that God does, and those body parts are put for various kinds of actions of God because of comparisons, Thomas says. He uses the word similitudes, similarities. Um, just think of comparisons. So again, back in the Summa, he says, just like the act of an eye is seeing, therefore, when God is said to have an eye in Holy Scripture, it signifies or it means his power to see or to understand intellectually. Of course, not physically, uh, because he doesn't have a body with which to see, but nonetheless, his knowledge faculties, if you like, his knowing powers are not diminished, but they're only increased because he knows with uh, his intellect. So that's the basic principle for how to interpret body parts of set of God in Holy Scripture. Um, they're set of God because of some divine action and the connection between the body part and the divine action is a comparison of some sort. In Psalm 8, Thomas talks about the works of God's fingers and gives three possible interpretations for what fingers specifically might mean. And these are things that all could be the case more generally and also specifically here in Psalm 8 and are what we might say good interpretive options, all of which are true options. <laughs> None of these things are false to say of God. They're true interpretations, but we're kind of leaving open what is the actual interpretation of this text, because that's a difficult question. What does this specific text mean by saying God has fingers and look at the sky? It's the work of his fingers specifically. What does God want us to, to know by that? Anyway, Three possible interpretations. The first is that fingers is placed for um, God's intelligence or God's skillfulness in, uh, in designing what he has made. So Thomas says, because what we do with our fingers specifically, we do with great attention and with great carefulness, therefore, what God is adverting us to by saying he has fingers is the fact that he has carefully and with great intellectual consideration made the heavens, i.e. by using his fingers. We might say use, God used his small motor skills and very finely tuned, if you like, um, the created order, specifically the heavens. 
Um, the second possible interpretation, and I really, really like this one, is that fingers are set of God here because making the glorious heavens and maybe even outer space, we would want to in include here the, the universe, uh, which is such a massive task for us, was nonetheless pinky work for God. Fingers here are put for light labor, if you like. Um, so when the psalmist says, look at the massive work of the skies, for God, it was just the work of his little itty bitty fingers. Uh, the intention of this, of course, is not to say God has fingers, but just to say this was easy for God because he is so strong. Um, Thomas even gives uh, some uh, quasi proof text, so to speak, where this seems to be the interpretation uh, in mind by saying he has fingers. He quotes Isaiah 40, 12, where Isaiah says, who has poised with his fingers the mass of the earth? So you've got the largeness of the whole earth and God is just like, doink, uh, emphasizing divine power. Okay. The third and final interpretation that Thomas gives as a possibility here is a little bit more difficult but it basically is saying that the heavens or the sky are said to be the work of God's fingers um, because it's very intricate work. So you kind of understand what's going on here, the basic logic. When we uh, get way down into some very, very minute or difficult task, we use our most nimble of body parts to do so. And therefore, the heavens specifically, because they're so complicated and interconnected and intertwined, you go out, look at the universe, um, it's being said to be God's finger work because of that intricacy. So God's fingers here are put for intricate labor, if you like. Um, and those are the three, generally speaking, interpretive options that Thomas gives, all of which have this in common. Note very carefully. None of them actually or properly are saying God has fingers. All of them are putting fingers for something else. And generally speaking, the uh, something else that the metaphor is being put for uh, has to do with divine activities. And we're running comparisons uh, to our fingers along the way. So that would be some basic gestures and the ones that Thomas gives here in his commentary on Psalm 8. Yeah, that, I think this is where uh, doing that that little negation, God is not a body, opens up for you a whole world of uh, really fruitful meditation. And um, I find that a lot of, um, so, you know, you, you can read the Bible just from cover to cover to be familiar with it. But yeah. then, you know, the blessed man is the one who meditates upon the law of God day and night. And this is where you can start to pierce through to, okay, what's, what is the metaphor and and like he gives these three different options. If I was preaching this text, I might just mm. give those three options and say uh, all of them are very powerful, like that God mm. has this great attention to detail, just like you have attention to detail. Or, you know, when we say I could lift that with my pinky, it's like mm. that's the Isaiah 40. You, you can. And, and that's where I think uh, scripture becomes a lot of fun. And, and mm. we're just looking at one text and what that teaches us about God is actually far more than if you were to just, if you were to say it properly, God has a finger that actually doesn't really tell you anything. Mm. It's when you recognize the metaphor that you start to contemplate God is thinking about me when he, you know, Psalm 139 knits me together in my mother's mm. womb. Mm -hmm. That that was both no trouble to him. And yet he gave so much attention to detail to doing mm. that. And now I'm ascending from corporeal things into God and and his real love, attention and care for me, which is really what I care about, whether it's like, does he have a finger or not? I don't know, but I want him to um, you know, be attentive to me um, and, and know what he's doing when he uh, you know, arises on my behalf. Um, I wanted to compare. So I have in front of me. So John uh, Damascene. Uh, he wrote a book, uh, well, he wrote a, a number of books, but he has this book on the Orthodox faith. This is from chapter 11. Mm -hmm. And he just goes through 
uh, the different body parts. I think he goes maybe from like eyes down to his feet. And mm. uh, Ryan, I'm just going to read uh, some of these sections and you can stop and interrupt me and and give me if you want uh, any of the other glosses that uh, Thomas or other people might give. I'll actually let me let me do fingers. Let me do hand first. Um, okay, so we can we can compare uh, how Damascene takes this. So okay. uh, he says God's hands mean the effectual nature of his energy, mm-hmm. for it is with our own hands that we accomplish our most useful and valuable work. OK, pretty, pretty similar there. Any comments you have on that one? Yeah, no, I think he's just saying uh, God has a hand means that he's strong and that he works, uh, I think is pretty straightforward and uh, no different, no real meaningful difference there. Yeah. Okay. Then when he goes on to his right hand, so we're talking about hands Mm -hmm. in general. Now, what about his right hand? Well, uh, Damascene says his right hand is his aid in prosperity, for it is Mm -hmm. the right hand that we also use when making anything of beautiful shape or of great value or where much strength is required. Yeah, so the notion of favor there, which I think most people know, even by just reading Holy Scripture, is extending the right hand of favor is even a phrase. Um, I think that's what the metaphor is picking up on here. Yeah, it reminds me also of, you know, uh, Jacob when he's blessing uh, Joseph's mm-hmm. sons at the end, and then there's the crossing of the hand. So mm-hmm. uh, there are some things we can just get from our own sense and use yeah. of our faculties. Uh, but then kind of like Aquinas does where he jumps to Isaiah 40, um, you can you can go look, you know, just type into a little uh, search program, you know, fingers or hands and just look at all the places. There are going to be many uh, where those show up. I thought of this on this fingers thing. It made me think of Psalm 144, where David says, uh, you train my hands for war and my fingers to fight or do battle. So this has a different shade of meaning on on the fingers. Yeah. Um let me see some of these I, I really like in Damascene. So his his eyes, that's pretty easy. But um, he says, hence by God's eyes and his eyelids uh, and sight, we are to understand his power of overseeing all things and his knowledge that nothing mm-hmm. can escape. For in the case of us, this sense makes our knowledge more complete and more full of certainty. And here you can, uh, this is a fun one where you think, I don't have eyes in the back of my head. I can only see what is in front of me. God has eyes, but his eyes see the back of his head, you know, if, if there was one. Um, but he can he can see everything in a way that that I cannot. Uh, by God's ears, he says, in uh, by God's ears and hearing is meant his readiness to be propitiated and to receive our petitions. For it is this sense that renders us also kind to suppliants, inclining our ear to them more graciously. Mm. Um, God's mouth and speech are his means of indicating his will, for it is by the mouth and speech that we make clear the thoughts that are in the heart. That one's pretty clear. Uh, here's one that you might not have thought of. God's food and drink. So what, what does it mean when God is eating something? This is important because God uh, commanded Israel to offer him food every single day. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the the wiser amongst them, the prophets, know, you know, you know, God doesn't actually need to eat any of this stuff. Mm. What he wants is a a heart. He wants justice. He wants mercy. So Damascene says, God's food and drink are our concurrence to his will. For we too satisfy the necessities of our natural appetite through the sense of taste. Ryan, what do you think about this one, food and drink? Yeah, I like it. Um, he's saying here that when we when we do what God desires, we are said to feed him and to give him drink. Um, I think Jesus is even picking this up when he says, uh, insofar as you've given a poor drink of water, you've clothed them, etc. You've provided for the needs of God when you provide for the needs of others, because that's what God desires. And therefore it is, as it were, satisfying God's desires. You hear that comparison. Mm -hmm. Um, And yeah, he draws attention to the fact that we have our natural appetites like hunger satisfied in this fashion. And therefore God picks this up to communicate when he is pleased and when we're doing the divine will, uh, when we are behaving in this, in this fashion. And it also, you mentioned the sacrificial system. It also cues us to look 
in that sacrificial system and its designs for the meaning of these sacrifices. Each one of the particulars, uh, the things being sacrificed are metaphors for various moral activities that we're supposed to do um, because it's massive logic of the system is we satisfy what God wants or make Jesus happy as we tell our children. Um, each one of these sacrifices and so on is, is, has a correspondent moral activity that really, that was the object lesson for and is what we're supposed to be looking for when we're reading the sacrificial system descriptions and Leviticus and, and numbers and so on. Yeah. I, I think it's in John four where Jesus says, you know, I have food that you don't know about. My food mm. is to do the will of God. And so it seems kind of this same mm. idea of doing, yeah. doing God's will. Uh, let me yep. run through these last ones and then we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up. He says, God's uh, sense of smell is his appreciation of our thoughts, uh, of our thoughts of and goodwill towards him. For it is through this sense that we appreciate sweet fragrance. Uh, mm. You can think of Paul talking about, you know, we're the aroma of, of Christ, aroma of life to mm. life, death to death. Uh, here's one, God's countenance. God's countenance is the demonstration and manifestation of himself through his works. For our manifestation is through the countenance. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think about this one? This is a hard one for me with um, the face of God. There mm -hmm. are many... Um, there are almost like an infinite kinds of countenances a human person could have, like the little micro expressions mm -hmm. we say that, that communicate so much. We, we speak in terms of body language. I could tell just by your countenance that you're displeased or that you're, you're pleased. Um, mm -hmm. I struggled for a lot of my life wondering what God's countenance was towards me. Um, is he happy? Is he mad? Is he sad? Mm -hmm. Brian, could you help us out? Help me out here. How should we think of God's countenance towards us? Oh boy, that's a, that is quite the question. And also a very spiritually poignant question for practical, um, just practical everyday spirituality. Um, You know, one of the things that it's always helpful to recognize when we start talking about the metaphors for God in the Bible is that God also gave us uh, a walking and talking, so to speak, metaphor. His name is Christ. So Christ is the physical manifestation of God. And it's a little bit difficult to tell all of the way God feels about you, perhaps, because he doesn't have a face. We can't watch his micro gestures and so on. Um, but as we see God in Christ, particularly as he responds and interacts with so many complex situations throughout the Gospels, we're filling in, as it were, uh, what it amounts to God's face, God's countenance towards us. So. That's where I would look for answers to those questions. Um, you want to know what God's face looks like? Look at Christ and the smiles and frowns of Christ are the smiles and frowns of God. Um, mm. And that will help you as you watch Christ know what pleases God and know what displeases him. And it's really as simple as that. It's not rocket science. Um, but so profound and life-shaping nonetheless. Yeah. So if you're uh, one of the places to kind of check your work when you're reading the Psalms or doing Old Testament is with mm. Christ and mm. what you know very plainly and in even literal sense when, you know, when Jesus mm. wept uh, at the death of Lazarus, uh, you're meant to conclude this mm. is how God uh, mm. who doesn't have eyes from which tears can flow um mm. if he did have a body and sees this he would be crying mm. and god probably feels and indeed does feel far more strongly um about this even than a human person could feel with with the body so i think where people feel like the metaphor 
is taking away something from God, I think you want to remember, no, it's actually spoken of in a lower degree um, Hmm. so that we can understand. And whatever it is that it's standing in for is actually something probably a lot more real, more powerful, more what, however you'd want to say it, um, then maybe even the metaphor demonstrates like God doesn't even need his finger, his little pinky finger to create the cosmos. Right. Um, any final thoughts on this God's body parts, um, discussion? No, I think that, uh, and I hope that folks will find it fairly confirming of what they I've always thought maybe just a little bit more precise, a little bit more, uh, you know, some of the fat trimmed off. Um, the real, the real advantage of being super clear at this kind of level, as I mentioned, is there's a lot more bodily aspects that are ascribed to God throughout Holy Scripture um, that are much less clear and much less intuitive to us. It's just more of the same kinds of moves that we've just seen here. So remember. The basics, as we proceed forward, uh, it will help you as we get into more difficult terrain, not to be thrown off when something is just metaphorical or something like that. Always to remember your true negations that you're certain of, these very simple things like God is not a body um, that will help avoid error and therefore open up the way of inquiry to apprehend what these metaphors in Holy Scripture really mean. Hmm. Well, I'll post in the show notes some of these texts that we are referring to from Damascene and Aquinas, if you want to look. I didn't actually read the full text from Damascene, but uh, I do invite you all to go look at that. And as you're just doing your, your Bible reading, uh, keep an eye out for you know, these, these body parts and then you know, think about uh, you know, what do I use this body part for? What, what, um, what is this saying about God? All right, with that, uh, we'll close. Until next time, uh, keep on reading.